Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly, officially the greatest podcast in the universe, because it's the only podcast that tries to uncover all the secrets lurking out there in the universe. You're listening to Dan. Thank you so much for finding us. Uh, This week on the show, we're learning about why the moon is called the moon. You can also hear about one of the most dangerous plants on the planet, and we'll get one of nature's strangest questions finally answered. You can find that out a little later on. Stay there. Uh, First, let's check in with our alien mates who are trying to get back home. This is NNG. NNG's Energy Challenge. It's the evil Zack troops from Antwermeda. They're firing at us. They're firing at us. Chill out, dude. It's just lightning. Lightning's a kind of energy. You get it on lots of planets. And not just on Zog, apparently. Energy? Yeah. Lightning is made of a type of energy called electricity. And it travels at 186,000 miles a second. That's the speed of light, N. Why don't we just dive in the lightning? It'll get us back to Zog in a flash. That's the stupidest thing you've ever said. What? Even more stupid than when you said my birthday was around the corner and so I went looking for it. Even more stupid. That is galaxy level stupid. But surely it would be the fastest way home. It'd be the fastest way to get burned into a fazoid toast rock. Guess us home in a flash indeed. A flash is all that would be left of you. Electricity can be very dangerous. But if it's packaged safely, it's a seriously cool type of energy that can be made from almost anything. Humans love it. Even dung from the yaks of Ursa Minor. Yep, animal and plant waste is a biofuel that could be used in power stations which churn out electricity. Sounds like magic. So what's electricery made of? The clue is in the name. Electricity is made with electrons. I thought electrons were the aliens who came from Electro 4 in the Kibinonic constellation. No, electrons are really tiny parts of atoms which normally whiz around the edge of atoms, like little moons in orbit. <laughs> what the? What's so sad about that? You're making me miss Zog and our 26 moons. I want to go home. Boo, calm down. <laughs> calm down. <laughs> Shut it. Electricity might help us get there. Ooh, all right, touchy. Atoms of different substances have different amounts of electrons. An earth metal called iron has 26 little electrons in each atom. But how are they powerful enough to be helpful or to turn you into a fazoid toast rack? Well, electrons are either positively or negatively charged, just like magnets. Opposites attract. Power generators send out positively charged electrons in a loop with a negative charge at the end. That's called a circuit. And circuits can be created all over the planet, carrying energy to do all sorts of handy things. Energy is amazingly great at changing from one type to another. Come on, check this out. Electrical energy can be changed into heat to power radiators and microwave ovens. What's cooking? <laughs> Chocolate pudding smells horrible. Ew, that must be for the really naughty children. Electrical energy can be turned into radio waves to make pictures and sounds in things like televisions and radios. <laughs> or into mechanical energy to help things like washing machines spin the clothes. Power telephones, toys, watches. Oh, OK. I get the point. Useful stuff. In fact... Electricity looks pretty electrifying, if you ask me. Hey, what's this? That's an iron, dude. Humans use it to make their clothes flat. Iron? So this iron has 26 electrons inside? Not that kind of iron, you great three-headed doofus. Watch out. Looks like we're going to fuse, G. Here it comes. Whoopee! I love a bit of fusion. Here it comes. Woohoo! NNG's Energy Challenge with support from National Grid. Find out more online at funkidslive.com slash energy. Let's do some of your questions then. I love these science questions. If you've got anything kind of rattling around your brain about the way the world and the universe and strange things in there work, leave it as a review for the show over on Apple Podcasts. That's what Arjinda has done, who asks, why is the moon called the moon? This isn't really kind of science, Arjinda. It's more words and etymology, where words come from. Now, the moon is called the moon because it it helps us track months. 
Well, it doesn't really anymore because we have calendars and phones and stuff. But many years ago, in ancient times, people would use the way the moon changed, you know, full moon, half moon, new moon. They would use that to measure when the month had passed so they could keep track of time. Now, the word moon goes back to a word from medieval times called mona, which goes back further to a Latin word, which means measure, and another Latin word, mensis, which means month. So moon comes from month, Arginda. Thank you for your question. Also, Auntie Wanty One, uh, who listens in with their dad whenever they can, asks, how does a rocket work? Now, there's a lot that goes into a rocket. I'll kind of take it down to its most simplest terms, Auntie Wanty. A rocket engine burns fuel. And it burns a lot of fuel at a hugely high heat. Now, when that fuel burns, it makes an extremely hot gas. That gas expands, it pushes out of the back of the rocket and drives it forward. You know when you run or something, you push your legs against the ground, that propels you forward. The gas that shoots out of the back of the rocket does a very similar thing. Uh, Thank you for the question. And finally, uh, Loppo... Loppo, yeah, Loppo, who is six years old, uh, asks, why is infinity the biggest number if it isn't a number? Well, stop thinking of it as a number, Loppo. It isn't one. It's more an idea of something that has no end, that's boundless, that's the largest amount of something that could be, that keeps going on and on and on. And because with numbers, you can keep counting and counting and counting. And I mean, you could keep counting for as long as the universe keeps existing. It's kind of pointless trying to define infinity as a proper number. It's an idea, not an actual number which exists. Lopo, thank you for the question. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on the show, leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. This week's guest is the science writer, Chris Woodford. Uh, he's the author of many incredible science books for kids. He's the brains behind the website. Explain that stuff as well, which I can tell you has helped this show out many, many times. And he's here to tell us all about the internet because it's been playing on my mind recently, what with being stuck at home. So, Chris, thanks for joining us. I'm very happy to be here. Let's go way back to the beginning. Um, why was the internet invented? Not, not how just yet, but why was it invented? Well, I suppose back in the beginning, there were relatively few computers about. Back in the 1940s, Thomas Watson, who was the boss of what was then the world's biggest computer company, said, uh, IBM, said uh, the world would need only about five computers. That was his prediction. The entire world would need five computers forever. And obviously, that was probably one of the worst predictions anyone has ever made. But <laughs> 60, 70, 80 years on, and now we have a billion computers, and we have lots of things that we want to do with them. And so the internet was really invented to link all those computers together and to link together all the people who want to use them. So that's really how the internet came about. Lots more computers, lots more people who wanted to use them, and lots more things people wanted to use them for. So the internet's all about connecting all these things together. Now, very basically, because I imagine the answer to this could take up a whole year's worth of this show, but when they have this idea that they want to connect people, they want to share information, how do they start making that happen? Like, what happens day one of trying to create the internet? Well, the first thing was to ensure that all these computers could talk to one another. I mean, when I was at school, which is going back several decades now, when I was at school, um, there were all sorts of different computers and none of those could talk to one another. They all worked in slightly different ways. Um, If you could program one computer, you couldn't program a different computer. So the first thing was to make sure that all these computers were talking the same language. So that's the essence of how the internet works, making sure everything talks the same language. And that's why, for example, your, you know, the iPhone in your pocket can now communicate over the internet with, say, a computer in 10 Downing Street, look at the 10 Downing Street website, or you can look at the NASA website, or you can look at the government of China's website. All computers now work the same way, essentially share information in exactly the same way. What is that language? Well, that language is, at its most basic, it's called ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, which really just means... Uh, the letters A to Z, the numbers 0 to 9, the basic characters, each one of those has a number. So, for example, the, the letter A would have one number, the letter B would have another number. So we, we translate all our letters and characters into numbers. And then every computer on the planet 
absolutely every computer on the planet can understand that system. So that's the essence of how they can all talk to one another. Now, without giving away your postcode, Chris, where do we find you right now? Geog where, where Geographically, I'm in yeah. Dorset on the South Coast. So you're in Dorset in the South Coast. I'm in South London. So there's a good stretch of, I, I don't know, I guess 100, 120 miles between us. Yet we're yeah. talking instantaneously. Can you talk us through the, I guess, the hardwired technology that that makes this happen so i'm talking into my computer which then goes to wi-fi to a router which then travels to your router which then chats to you how does that work yeah well it's amazing isn't it because we are actually conducting this in this interview over the internet and without the internet this would not be possible i'd have to get on a train and come up to london and sit in a studio with you and all that sort of thing but the essence of the internet is really the telephone for, for, for most of us the essence of the internet is the telephone network and there are three parts to that. There's a, there are wired cables, um, like sort of grubby bits of old copper twisted together. Telephone engineers call them twisted pairs. Uh, and then there are fiber optic cables. So that means fiber optics means sending signals down little thin strands of glass and plastic using laser beams. And then, as you say, there's wireless. So that's Wi-Fi, mobile phone signals. And the internet is a mixture of all these three different things coming together. And the reason we... I guess the reason we don't realize that the internet is so amazing is that all that stuff is actually hidden away. The wired cables are all sort of hidden away in your walls, the walls of your house and buried underground. The fiber optic cables are dug underneath the streets of London or wherever you happen to live. And wireless connections, well, it, well, you know, when you're using your mobile phone to talk to um, a wireless mast that might be on a building 10 streets away. It's all happening invisibly with radio waves. So the amazing thing about the internet is that most of the technology that makes it happen is completely invisible. So Chris, I know that some of the information that you can pass down the internet through these lines that you talk about, it you know, quite big chunks of information, gigabytes of stuff. How does the internet break that up into small manageable bits to help move it? Well, that's a really interesting question. And I like to think of, think about this in the same way that if you were, say, trying to move house. Let's say I wanted to move house from London to Scotland or from Scotland to London. But I didn't just want to move the contents of my house. I wanted to move the entire house. Well, I could, you know, you could sort of imagine digging up the foundations of the house and hiring this huge, great lorry and putting the house on the back of the lorry and then trying to drive this lorry and it sooner or later it would get stuck somewhere it would get stuck under a bridge or it would you know it would not be possible to send such a massive amount of information and the internet has the same sort of problem when you try to send a large piece of information so instead of sending a huge great piece of information what you do instead is break it up into lots of little packets and going back to the idea of the house it's a bit like if you're moving the house you break the house into in, you know take it apart and break it into individual bricks and you put each brick in an envelope and you post those bricks to your new address in scotland or wherever it happens to be and some of those bricks might travel on the road network some might go by you know by helicopter or some might go by ship over the sea and eventually they would all arrive at your new address and you could put them all back together again and you'd have your house so by breaking this gigantic amount of information into tiny little packets, you can send it very efficiently. Some packets go one way, some go another way. And this technology, which is called packet switching, is actually the essence of how the internet works and how it can work so efficiently and how it can send so much information all at once uh, in so many different ways. And it does that all around the world, doesn't it, Chris? How does internet traffic get round the world? Because between... You know, between me in London and you in Dorset, it, it's mostly road, a few fields and a couple of hills, your end. Um, a few but, sheep, yeah. <laughs> but there's oceans, there's mountains across the world. Uh, how does that work? Well, it's actually very interesting because, again, going back to what I was saying before about the internet mostly being invisible, it turns out that there are just hundreds of cables going underneath the ocean. I think it's something like 400 submarine cables that go all around the world carrying internet traffic. There are 40 or so of these all around the coast of Britain. There are, I think there are about 12 around the coast of France. And so each country has got all these cables coming in and out of it. And um, if any one of these cables broke, you know, something like a, a sea monster, if there are such things, chomped through one of these cables it actually doesn't matter because there's so many of them 
that you could just send the packets of information we were talking about a few minutes ago. You could just send those packets via another cable. So if our connection between England and France was broken, we could send the information off to Ireland perhaps, and then Ireland could send it round to somewhere else, and eventually it would get to France via another route. Now, through uh, lockdown while being stuck at home, uh, I've had to use this time to speak to family all around the world on Zoom and FaceTime and, and, and all of that stuff. Um, and I'm always blown away that it happens so quickly. I mean, th there's almost 10,000 miles between the UK and Australia. Yet I can see my auntie, we can speak uh, without any gap as if she was in the same room. How does it happen instantaneously? Well, the essence of the internet, as I was saying, couple of minutes ago is that um, we're using a mixture of wired cables, fiber optic cables, wireless, and through all those three different types of connections, information travels at almost the speed of light. So uh, speed of light, that means a uh, piece of information traveling at the speed of light can go something like seven times around the world in one second, or if you think about the sun, the sun sends its beams of light to us in about eight minutes. So speed of light is essentially the answer to that question. Incredible. Um, Chris, you've kind of covered all the questions I've got now, but I'm always getting these internet things. So no doubt uh, I'll ping you a message later and we'll try and get you back on. Uh, Chris Woodford, as I say, he's written so many amazing science books. You can look them up on the website, chriswoodford.com. Uh, Chris, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Now, this week's Dangerous Dan is something that farm animals should be terrified of. It's Puja chilensis. It's a species of plant called a bromeliad, which is a distant cousin of the pineapple. Very interesting. Uh, it looks a bit like a pineapple as well, but it's it's a plant that you don't want to mess with. It's very strange looking bit of flora. It looks like a, like a big bit of corn, you know? with yellowish flowers that are separated by thick spikes that look a bit like Christmas trees. And it's probably the best predatory plant in the world. Its spiky body traps sheep and other smaller farmyard animals, and they can't get free. It holds the animals in the spikes until they starve, and then they die. Now, why does it do it? The plant probably isn't conscious, um, and, and, and they can't eat like we do. They don't have a mouth to shovel things into. Well, most don't anyway. But it, like all wildlife, it wants to survive. The animals decompose when they starve, and their body breaks down into the ground around the plants, which fertilises the soil, and it lets the Puja chilensis thrive and grow. It's incredible, isn't it, that this plant, such a simple-looking plant, has such an efficient way of destroying animals so it can live. Let's have a look inside your body now with Professor Hallux. Hallux's Physiology Fixer. Just a few more tweaks. That should do it. Nurse Nanobot, check it out. What's up, Alex? Finally, I've completed my greatest invention of all. A brand new urinary system for the human body. Let me introduce the Biofiltration Extrapolator. It's a sieve. A motorised sieve. And actually, my sieve. That's the one I rinse my fungal spores out in. I want it back. Well, what it is now is a new and improved way for a human body to get rid of waste. No more mucky trips to the toilet. With the biofiltration extrapolator, everything will be filtered and rinsed away. Professor, the urinary system is a very complicated part of the body. It has all sorts of jobs to do and can only do these jobs because of the way it's constructed and the way it works with other parts of the body. I know, and this time I'm quietly confident to put it to the test. Loading physiology file. Urinary system, job one. Kidneys are kept busy, making sure that blood has just the right amount of water in it. They extract water that isn't needed along with waste from the bloodstream. This watery waste is turned into urine, commonly known as we. Hmm, there's more to this urinary system than I thought. I hadn't connected it up to the bloodstream at all. Systems in the body often need to be connected to other organs and systems in order to carry out their jobs properly. 
physiology fail. Urinary system. Job two, ureters transport urine from the kidneys to the bladder in two neat tubes. There's nothing neat about that sieve, Professor. I think it's sprung a leak. Look, water's going everywhere. Never mind a tube, we need a mop. Physiology fail. Maybe a sieve with smaller holes. Or maybe not a sieve at all. There's still a couple of jobs left. Hang on. Urinary system. Job three. The bladder's job is to store urine. Most of the time you can decide when to wee. And at that time muscles tell the bladder to release the urine. Or muscles can squeeze to stop yourselves from weeing until you get to a toilet. Well, there's no stopping this waste. Didn't you think about connecting it to some sort of control mechanism? Well, I am now. Physiology fail. Urinary system, job four. The urethra carries urine from the bladder to the outside of the body. Because its opening is very small, it's normally easy to wee without making a big mess. A definite fail, Hallux. Turn the blooming thing off. Physiology fail. I think that much is clear. It's useless, unless you want your laboratory two feet deep in we. I don't think anyone wants that nanobot. But cheer up, Alex. We've learned a lot today. Studying physiology can help us understand all sorts of living things better, whether it's a tree or a Tyrannosaurus rex. Wow. Imagine how much we a T-Rex would make. Well, getting rid of waste is something that most living things have to do. When we understand how the job is done in one type of living thing, sometimes that knowledge can be used to make sense of other living things. So it's not time wasted then after all. Wasted. Do you get it? Ha uh ha. -huh. Very funny, Professor. Hallux's Physiology Fixer. With support from the Physiological Society. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Hallux. It's time for this week's Science in the News. One of nature's greatest mysteries has been solved. Scientists have figured out how butterflies fly. Now, they've struggled to understand this for ages as their wings are large... But they've always thought they'd be too delicate, too flimsy uh, to, to generate enough air, enough power and thrust to fly. Now, using a wind tunnel and high-speed cameras, scientists in Sweden have figured it out. It turns out their wings meet together when they flap downwards and they clap, which makes an air pocket. When they release this and stretch them outwards, it gives them a strong jet of air which lifts them. Also, Virgin Orbit, which is Sir Richard Branson's company, who do Virgin Media, Virgin Airlines, Virgin Atlantic, that kind of thing, they've uh, managed to take satellites into space. They were launched under the wing of one of Virgin Airlines' old 747 jumbo airplanes. The rockets then dropped from the plane in the air. They flew the satellites into space, which is big news. By using a jet plane as a launch platform, it means spacecraft can be put into space from anywhere in the world. And finally, scientists have found that electric eels work together to zap prey. They gather in packs to stun the prey, their food, with a synchronised electric shock, uh, which is big news, because before scientists only thought they worked alone. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. If you've got something sciencey that you want answered on the show, uh, leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. I will see that. Leave your name so I can say hello. Drop us five stars as well. That'll help me notice it. Uh, while you're on Apple, it's one of the best places that you can hear so many podcasts we make at Fun Kids. Not just science stuff. We've got ones about uh, books. Uh, we've got silly ones in there as well. All sorts of topics are covered. You can also find them on Spotify, on Google, wherever you get your shows. They're on the free Fun Kids app as well and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen to us all over the country on your DAB digital radio, uh, on that free Fun Kids app, and at funkidslive.com. <laughs>